Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Mr. Dean Arif. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon uh, to yang berbahagia Datuk Ng Lee Bin, Group Managing Director of Tomei Consolidated Perhad, Tan Sri Tan Sri, Datuk Datuk, Datin Datin and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, coming here on a busy Thursday uh, afternoon to listen to my talk today entitled Silver, The Undervalued Investment of the Century. And I put emphasis on silver being undervalued for a reason. Okay, uh, let me just put on my bottom slide here. Okay. Okay. Before I start my presentation, a little disclaimer. Um, this presentation is not aimed at forecasting the price movement of silver. So this is not a technical analysis presentation. Yeah. Um, I do not have a magic crystal ball that, I, that can accurately predict the future. Yeah. However, um, the analysis in this presentation are grounded on fundamental and value-based metrics. So, rather than trying to uh, predict by technical analysis of the price of one silver, I give you the underlying basis why uh, silver currently is undervalued and point you where the price of silver ought to be. Clear? Okay. All right. The content I'm going to cover this afternoon will be uh, a little bit of history and the role of silver as monetary metal, the role of silver in the health industry, the role of silver in the modern industry, the supply of silver, the challenges uh, uh, where do silver come from and also the challenges of getting the silver supply and also the growing demand of silver in the modern world and when we put this all together, mesh it all together why it is an investment opportunity of the century so a little bit of history uh, Winston Churchill used to say the further back you look into history the further to the front that you can see in the future does that make sense? Right? Because history often repeats itself. It happens again and again and again, and humans just don't learn from past mistakes. And I'm going to present to you some, some things that happened in the past that uh, is happening again right now. So a little bit of history all right, uh, on silver. How come silver come to, uh, to use today? How come today we have silver bullion or silver bars? Yeah. Uh, as you know, for thousands of years, silver has been money. Yeah? It began some 5,000 years ago in Anatolia, uh, which is a modern-day Turkey. The early loads were a valuable resource from the, for the civilization. Yeah? So, in the past, uh, before we had all this civilization flourishing, yeah? Yeah, I tried to juggle mic and... I think I'll stand there. I prefer to walk around. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to remain still here. Yeah. Okay. I, I prefer a little mic actually, but it's alright. It's okay, no problem. I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, stay here. Okay. Alright. Uh, I'm trying to, my, my notes are not synced with the up there, so uh, do forgive me if I have to look up up there uh, once in a while. So, uh, civilization, uh, human civilization. Oh, is there? Okay, good. <laughs> Um, the stages of human civilization, uh, we, we started out with butter. Yeah? We, we butter for goods and services. But butter has got some limitation, isn't it? Right. Once uh, the human started to discover currency as the common mode of payment, suddenly, um, suddenly trade flourishes, uh, wealth is being created, states and government are able to tax and then that's how empire and civilization are built right so the the early discovery of silver mines and silver loads and the making of it into uh, currency was a very valuable thing that happens for human civilization so in about 1200 bc the center of silver production 
It used to be in Anatolia, then it shifted into uh, Greece's Laurel Mines, where it continued to feed the region's flourishing empires. And then in about 100 AD, Spain became the capital of silver production, supplying to the Roman Empire, as well as to the trading component along the Asian spice routes. These are very crucial trading routes and uh, trading activity. Then we had the Moorish invasion of Spain. The practice of silver mining migrated to Central Europe. So there are several other major silver mine discoveries yeah, occurred between 750 and 1200 AD, including the Germany and Eastern Europe. Okay. And we had a period of 500 years, from 1000 to 1500 AD, where a significant growth happening thanks to increased uh, technology. Uh, they, they managed to find more clever ways to refine silver, find more clever ways to extract silver from the ground and that, that, uh, that can bring in more silver into, into trade. Okay. However, no single event in the history of silver rivals the importance of the discovery of the New World in 1492. Who knows what is the discovery of New World? Who knows what I'm talking about? The American continent, correct. Yeah. Okay. This momentous finding and the years that followed reinvented the role of silver throughout the world. Okay. The Spanish conquest of the New World led to the mining of silver that dramatically eclipsed anything that had come before that time. Before 1500, uh, 1500 to 1800, Bolivia, Peru, and Mexico accounted for over 85% of the world production and trade. And later, several other countries began to contribute substantially, notably the United States with the discovery of the Comstock Lode. This is a very famous uh, discovery, the Comstock Lode in Nevada. Silver production continued to expand worldwide, growing from 40 to 80 million ounces annually by the 1870s. And we had a period of 1876 to 1920 represented an explosion in both technological innovation and exploitation of new regions worldwide. So production over the last quarter of the 19th century quadrupled over the average of the first 75 years to nearly about 120. This is the annual production, 120 million ounces. So similarly, new discoveries in Australia, Central America, this is a more recent time, yeah? Europe uh, it intensified the total world silver production. So we had the 20 years between 1900 to 1920. Uh, that itself resulted in 50% increase in global production and brought the total to about 190 million ounces annually. These increases were spurred by discoveries in Canada, United States, Africa, Mexico, Chile, Japan and other countries. And today, after more than 5,000 years, after the first ancient culture first began to mine this precious metal, first in a small, small uh, uh, production, and till now it averages about 670 million ounces. Last year figure was close to 800 million ounces per year. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the role of silver in our monetary system. Okay. Uh, the best investment that you can do right now, actually investment in education, uh, educate yourself, educate yourself on the history of money, educate yourself in the history of global finance. Yeah. Once you know that, then you know what to do. Right? So I'm going to give you a, 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 some education on monetary history. All right. So the areas known. Uh, coins came from the city of Ephesus in Ionia, it's about 650 BC. Okay. But back then, um, the metal have, uh, do not have consistent purity and consistent weight. All right. So it still cannot be used as true money because uh, the definition of money, it needs to be uh, consistent purity, consistent weight, needs to be durable, it needs to be uh, divisible. All right. So this is the first attempt, human attempt, of creating some sort of currency. So uh, the Ionians, um, they mix the gold and silver in 50-50 ratio, and they strike it with uh, only one side. Uh, the face you see, the, is the, uh, 
lion and bull, that was the first coin ever discovered. Okay. Only a century later, <coughs> Croesus, king of neighboring Lydia and famous for his wealth, become, becomes the first ruler to mint coins in pure gold and pure silver instead of mixing it up. Yeah? So, uh, and he also minted it in standard purity and standard weight. So, like the earlier coins, uh, his are still stamped on just one side. They didn't have the technology to stamp on both sides back then. Yeah, it was only struck on one, one side. Okay. So, and they also show the facing heads of a lion and bull. Okay. And then great cities to the west of Lydia and the great Persian Empire to the east were quick to adopt the useful new technique of metal currency. By the end of the 6th century, coinage was common throughout the region. This was, a, was an important human discovery. Money. Yeah. Money was one of human uh, greatest discovery that, that, that builds empire, that builds civilization. That, and then that gives us modern, uh, the, our modern day facility right now, the convenience that we have right now. Okay. Alright, like I said just now, if you can look far into the past, you can roughly predict what's going to happen in the future. Right? Because history repeats uh, itself again and again and again. It amazes me. For thousands of years, it always happened, the same cycle uh, happened again and again and again. All right? And we as humans just don't learn. And uh, once I show some of the history, you, you can start to relate of what is going on in our world right now. Okay? As I show this, you try to relate to our current scenario right now. So, <coughs> Athens was the first major empire. Uh, it goes through all empire goes through the same cycle. There are seven cycles. First, they have good sound money, and, and then trade flourishes. When trade flourishes, wealth is created. The people are more wealthy, and then, then the state can tax the, the population. And when the state start to tax, the state will uh, start to take on more uh, project. Uh, back then, also they had uh, public public projects, public amenities, and then the Greek sets in, they go to war, right? So, why did Athens debase? Again and again, eh? it's these two things, greed and war. And you can start to see this happening again right now, as we speak, all over the world. Right? So Athens became embroiled with its rival in a war for longer than anticipated. It was a long, drawn out war for 22 years. And at the same time, while they were at war, they still built public works like those um, ancient architect, architecture that you see. Uh, back then, they were, they, those were the white elephants of, of, of those days. You know, they were uh, buying things that they don't need. They were building things that, they don't, uh, that the people don't really need. Uh, at the same time, they go to war. Okay. So, they were doing but deficit spending. Sound familiar? Deficit spending, and the empire had a national debt. Sound familiar? Yeah. So, to fund those budget deficit, what do they do? So they be, they began to debase the currency. They they were mixing pure gold with copper, right? So the state didn't have money, so they were doing they were going into war. They were building public amenities. And soon they were spending all the goals that, 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 that there is in the empire. So after a while they discovered, hey, we don't have enough gold, what do we do? So they became a little bit clever, they said, why don't we add in a bit of copper? Maybe people don't know. Right. So they began uh, putting 50%, uh, they began mixing half, half and half, half gold and half, half copper. Yeah, that, it goes through that, yeah, uh, that is a corner or omatic. From 100 coins, when they mix up with copper, they get 200 points. Yeah. So we had, uh, so people find out, you know, they were doing this again and again and again until that 50% gold becomes 25, becomes 12.5, becomes 10, 5, until virtually it becomes nothing but copper flakes. Yeah. This is what happened. If the state continue to do this, what good can it do? Yeah. What repercussion? if the state continue to debase the currency? Anybody? 
if the state can continue creating, you know, uh, it's cheap for them to produce this uh, dinari, this money. Uh, instead of using gold, now they are they're using copper, but still with the same face value. What happened? And it floods the market. Soon people realize that when, when all these coins enter the market, enter the free market, people start to realize that hey, this is not right. You know? And soon prices of goods and services went up and inflation sets in. And when inflation sets in, people will be suffering. True or not? Yeah? There are some parts of the people who will be uh, marginalized. They will not be able to, to buy food. And if it's happened bad enough, revolution happened, which happens to atoms. Yeah? Uh, the, the, the empire collapse. Usually, in any collapse of empire, they always do this thing, they always debase the currency. Yeah? Okay. So we look at Rome, same thing happened. Yeah? This, this is the next great empire. Again, why did they debase? Same thing. It's always greed and war. Greed and war. And this time they had unemployment. Uh, the Romans are, are, are like the, the, some of the governments that we have today. They have they have welfare system, right? For the, the poor or the unemployed gets their unemployment benefit. They had that also last time. Yeah? Because it was a democracy, they need to win votes. So they had to give candies to the people. So this is the candy that they were giving, the unemployment benefit. Where do they get the money? Where do they get the money to fund this? The, the war, the, the public works. Yeah. They also had an expanding army because they were going to into war. They, want, they wanted to conquer new territory. They had public works also. Big giant buildings. You know, they were building temples. Big gigantic temples. All over the place. Uh, do you see that happening right now? People building big buildings, tall buildings, public works they call it. Right. So relate that to what's happening right now. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not just going to say Malaysia, but all over the world. Okay. Uh, so the, Athens, the, the Romans did it differently. Instead of um, adulterating the gold, they add extra zero to their coins. So, you had uh, 10 denarii. They said, okay, we need to um, increase the currency, uh, currency amount in our uh, empire. So what they do, they just cut an extra zero. Lo and behold, that 10 denarii becomes 100 denarii. Kind of like you take out your 10 ringgit, uh, the state will just add extra zero at the back. Lo and behold, uh, instead of buying one plate of chakwe you can buy 10 plate of chakwe no, no, just like that. But soon, it will catch up, isn't it? If there are too many of this, the, the extra zero, or currency with extra zero going circulating in the market, soon prices of goods and services will catch up. True or not? Yeah? That's exactly what happened. Yeah? Oops. And that's the downfall of the Roman Empire as well. The greed, war, and the debasement of the currency. Now I'm going to move to modern times, um, Weimar Republic. Okay. So one of the most interesting cases in history illustrating just how bad the effects of currency creation can be is the 1924 hyperinflation that took place in today's uh, the modern day Germany. Okay. All right. When World War I began, Germany went off the gold standard. They had a gold standard. Gold standard. They were using paper currency, but it was uh, tethered or anchored to gold. By 1924, they were <coughs> the gold standard. And the citizens were no longer able to redeem the mark for gold and silver money. So they had uh, bimetallic currency, gold and silver, and then uh, they, uh, they just cut off their tie. Okay. So again, uh, with Weimar Republic, we had war, we had greed, we had uh, unemployment, now uh, with fear and loss of confidence. After the war, Germany had made the first war repatriation payment to France. What is a war repatriation payment? This is kind of like you are in school, you get bullied, and your lunch money gets stolen. Uh, something like that. Okay? <laughs> Alright. So, after a while, uh, yeah, the German government didn't have the 
to, uh, didn't have to go to make a second payment. So this is kind of like protection money, lah. Eh? You lose in a fight, uh, you gotta pay back your bully, and after a while you don't have that that money to pay. Yeah. So in January 1923, <coughs> France and Belgium did get paid. So they invaded, uh, invaded and occupied the road, which is the industrial capital headland of Germany. So in the meantime, the German government was printing, printing like crazy. It was, it was putting its printing presses into overdrive, printing 50 quadrillion marks a day by November. Can you imagine? I cannot fathom that number. 50 quadrillion. I can barely imagine billion. Trillion is... There's so many zeros. Quadrillion, you know, it's, it's beyond my uh, reality box. Okay. So as a result, can you imagine if they were printing so much, they were using, cutting down, chopping down trees to make paper. And this is a fact. In 1914, a pair of shoes cost 10 marks. Okay. Eight years later, not the same pair of shoes, maybe a pair of shoes that comes from the same factory now costs 1,400 marks. And then after the currency being hyperinflated in just one short year, that pair of shoes that comes up from the same factory now cost 30 what? How many zero can you count that? 30 what? Billion? Trillion. 30 trillion for a pair of shoes. Okay? So, who can give me an example of most more recent time? Which country? Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, yeah. And it's very famous. One trillion Zimbabwe dollar can buy you only one egg. Now can I can't even buy you after for for a short while one trillion. Yeah? Have you seen the picture of children, Zimbabwe children carrying currency like that? You know, go to the market just to buy some uh, vegetables or your know, groceries. And the thing is, all currency, all fiat currency, is mathematically built in to do just that. Right. I'm an engineer, I, I, I studied advanced mathematics and when I look at the mathematics of currency creation, every currency in human history, in every fiat currency, have a 100% failure rate, it's 100% track record. Okay. So the only currency or money that doesn't suffer the same fate is what? Yeah, louder, the gold and silver. Alright, so for 5,000 years, gold and silver has never failed. What currency do? Every single currency, you go from A to B, half of B, there's about, about 600 over currency in the world. If you study the history, they all go to zero. Right? So, why? I want to go back to why human civilization choose silver and gold as money. Why it was the perfect form of money. Okay? The one that you have in your pocket right now. Have some. Okay. This is good for a while. Okay. I'm not here to insult anybody or government. It's just, just to show you that this is good only for a while. Okay. It's got expiry date. Doesn't, it's not written yet the expiry date, but mathematically it has an expiry date. When you will feel it in your skin. All right. You know it. Okay. All right. Why was silver chosen? By nature. Okay. Silver is a monetary metal by nature because it has a certain quality. If you look at the Bible, the scripture, a lot of uh, the scripture, Bible and the Quran, silver is mentioned first as money. Silver, not even gold. Silver was mentioned as money. Okay. All right. Because silver is malleable. What does it mean by being malleable? Yes, it's, it's soft enough. Yeah? You can bend it, you can shape it. So, malleability is a relative softness that allows silver, like gold, to be pressed into coins with ease. That's why you see those maple leaf. They are very beautiful. Don't you think so? Uh, it is, it is, uh, you know, they, they, it goes through a process where they, they flatten it, they die cut it. After that, it goes through a mold to give you that beautiful design front and back. If silver is hard like titanium, you will not be able to get the, those nice designs. Yeah? Silver gold will be able to give you those beautiful designs. If it's still 
may be a bit difficult. You will not get that intricate design. Okay. So silver is so soft that it can be hammered so thin that 100,000 sheets of silver wouldn't stand higher than an inch thick. Okay. It, is, it is soft enough that you can press it down so thin like a paper and yet it will not tear under its own weight. It is soft and yet strong. Silver and gold. Okay. So the next property that makes silver as the perfect form of money, it is divisible. You can actually cut the silver. You take the, one of those maple leaves, you cut it into half. The other half will have half the value of the other half. Correct or not? If you take a gold bar, one kilo gold bar, you take an axe, you chop it into half, the other half got value or not? The other half got value or not? Okay. You try to do that with ringgit. If I tear this, I make payment to you. Uh, I tear this, I give you 50 ringgit, I give you 50 ringgit. Can or not? No. Can or not? Uh? Alright. Uh? Uh, that's why they had to print a smaller uh, denomination notes to make it uh, divisible. But silver in itself is divisible. Silver and gold. Okay. Uh, plus, you see uh, some of the gold, the maple leaf. I saw some one troy arms, and you can also get one tenth of an ounce. It is also divisible, the, the state or the mint can be it in a smaller denomination. So you, you, they take the trouble of you cutting it. In the past, past civilization, they actually physically cut it. And it's still laku. You know? the, the gold and silver, when you cut it, uh, it is still acceptable in the market. But uh, Royal Canadian Mint uh, have taken the trouble, and instead of you cutting it, they come up with a smaller denomination. They even have the one gram beautiful button, so you can uh, you know, just buy from that small instead of cutting it. Okay, the third one, why silver or gold is good as money, it is consistent. Okay, one troy ounce in my pocket, same weight, same purity, will buy the same amount of things as the one troy ounce in your pocket. Yeah. Say, if you have one troy ounce in your pocket right now, that can buy one cow, you are in China, and I'm here in Malaysia, one troy ounce can also buy this, buy, the, buy one cow also. So it is consistent. Atomic structure is the same. That silver can come from anywhere in the world. It is the same. <coughs> right? Yeah? Okay, another thing, silver has got intrinsic value. Paper got or not? If, touch wood lah, if anything happened to the Malaysian government and cease to exist tomorrow, will this have value? Uh, during the time of uh, uh, Japan, uh, when Japan was in Malaya, Japan lost the war. There's, there's a lot of banana money circulating around. When Japan left Malaysia, those banana money, has it got value? No. All right. Had they used silver, even if they go in and out, that silver will, will still have value, true or not? Okay? So, silver has got intrinsic value because of its usage, because it is desired. Another property of silver uh, that's not present in other metal is that silver is very durable. Okay. First, we talk about its Temperature durability. If you have a heap of silver at home and a heap of cash and your house got fire, alright, which one do you think will last, will survive the fire? The silver or the cash? So, so it's obvious that the, the, silver has got a melting point about 700 degrees C. Yeah? So most home fire, it doesn't reach 1000 degrees C. So silver will still be there after the house fire. You can go back to the house, you can save whatever gold and silver you've got from that house. Another thing, silver has, does not corrode. It will oxidize, but it doesn't corrode unlike steel. Say so one thing, if you, if you, some of you are silver, uh, silver partner, you have silver, you bought some silver, you notice that after a few years, it will tarnish, it will turn yellow or it will turn black. This is the oxidation layer. And that oxidation layer, oxidation layer itself is very important. Don't look at it as something ugly. That oxidation layer is a protection film. Uh, silver oxide is very strong, it forms a protective layer. So oxygen will not be able to oxidize the bottom layer. Unlike steel, if you have iron or steel, it gets rusted, the top layer of the oxidation will peel off and expose the new uh, layer underneath and the process of corrosion will continue until that bar of steel or bar of iron will be nothing left. After many years, it will be nothing left but dust and the earth become red. But for silver, it will, 
it will oxidize the top layer, and that's it. And it can remain like that for thousands of years. Okay. And gold doesn't corrode at all. At standard room temperature and, and pressure, one atmospheric pressure, uh, gold does not oxidize at all. Silver will oxidize a little bit, but the oxidation layer itself is very, very useful. Okay. All right. So that's why it's been used as, as money. Uh, another property of money, it has to be rare. Right? Can you use banana as money or not? Can you use sand as money or not? Because it's abundant, it's everywhere. So for it to be used as money, it has to be difficult to obtain, it has to be rare. So all the silver that has ever been mined throughout history, if you can place it all in one place, it will, it will only take up a space of 52 cubic meter. All right? It is only 52 meter high, slightly shorter than Big Ben in London. Okay? That's how much silver that has been mined throughout history. It's only that much. So, I'm uh, not sure whether it's clear. All right. On the earth crust, this is not the total earth, huh? only on the top layer, the crust, huh? you have to dig up 12.5 tons of earth just to get one gram of silver. You have to dig up that much earth just to get one gram. Can you imagine one troy ounce? The amount of work is being put to, to get that. And if you buy that one troy ounce for even 100 ringgit, I think it's really, really undervalued for the amount of work that's been done to extract it from the earth. If you talk about gold, it's 10 times. You have to dig up maybe 130 tons of soil, of earth, just to get one gram of gold. So it's very, very rare indeed. Okay. Now I'll talk about the application of silver, and not only on, as jewelry or, or money. Uh, in the past, this is, this is something that is lost in the modern world. Okay. In the past, even during ancient time, and for thousands of years, silver has been regarded as a versatile healing metal. Okay? In ancient societies such as Greece, Rome and Macedonia, silver was used to control spoilage, infection and illnesses. Silver has got this amazing property to kill bacteria, to kill germs. Okay? Uh, I want you to Google up sil colloidal silver. Okay? Colloidal silver is something uh, that is not really talked about in the mainstream market, but it has got these antibiotic properties. I'm not here to give you medical advice or to mislead you. you know, if you're a doctor, I'm so sorry. But please do look it up. Uh, do an independent thinking. That it could be in the, in the future, uh, future of antibiotics, uh, people will be using silver ions. Yeah? So silver ions prevent bacterial growth and speed healing. It speed up healing time. It can be found in everything from bandages to eye drops to newborn babies. No, sorry, new, uh, I drop for newborn babies. Um, this one, I just checked my uh, tooth, toothbrush at home. Okay. This is interesting application. This is called antibacterial nano silver. So you, have, you see the bristle of the toothbrush is infused with silver. Okay. So that you don't get the funny green or black stuff growing on it. Yeah. Disgusting, right? If you see some green stuff. Like this one will not. And this tooth, toothbrush. Uh, theoretically, should last you longer and should not uh, harbor any germs. Would you like to brush your teeth and, you know, not knowingly there's uh, germs inside, inside there, especially if it's near the whoosh, right? So this, this will, uh, this is a very interesting application of silver, right? Okay, um, you may not be able to read that. So in the past, uh, silver was used to prevent illness. Yeah, during the bubonic plague, bubonic plague, wealthy people, rich people, uh, royalty, they ate with silverware, yeah, silver dishes to protect themselves against disease. Right? There's also another reason why uh, the, the rich people were using silverware. What was it? When they were eating, they were using silverware. What, what was the reason? Uh, yeah, antibiotic, it kills germs. What else? Check for poison. Exactly. If there's poison present in the food, the silver one will turn black. Black color. That's true. Okay. So that will save these people from being poisoned. Right. So that's why uh, rich, uh, the rich in the past, when they were the babies were born, it is also a common practice to put the silver spoon in the mouth to prevent bacterial growth, to prevent germs. 
So that, that's why you get this uh, saying, somebody born with a silver spoon in the mouth. Okay, this is where the phrase come from. Okay, only the rich can afford to have silverware and prevent illness by putting silver in the in the mouth. You know, it's been done many times. It probably worked, right? you know. All right, and now they have scientific proof to to show that it does work. Okay. And uh, for traveler, when they travel long distances, they carry dairy product or milk. Uh, they actually put silver dollar, silver dollar in a bottle of milk, and it can last twice longer because silver will kill off the bacteria that, that causes spoilage in milk. Okay. So this is an interesting uh, application of silver. Okay. Now next, I'll talk about uh, silver uh, in the industry. Uh, see, silver has got many unique property that uh, made it an industrial godsend. Okay. And year on year, there's more patents being issued that uses silver than any other metals. Combine, right? The, the, like I said, the uses of silver is in a tooth, tooth, toothbrush. Uh, you have it in a medical stent. It's also that is infused with silver to prevent uh, uh, bacterial or germs. Okay. Uh, when I was in school, I always thought that gold was the best conductor. Who? How many of you learned that? Well, in school, in high school, uh, you were taught by your teacher, oh, gold is the best conductor, a thermal and electrical conductor. When I went to university, okay. I learned thermodynamics because I was an engineer back then. Uh, I realized that at the top of the table was actually silver. That shocked me. You know, silver was silver is the is the best. It has the highest conductivity, thermal and electrical. Okay. Uh, interesting also, silver has got the highest reflectivity. Reflectivity in that in that uh, narrow spectrum of uh, visible light, three metals reflect very well, which is gold. Aluminum and silver, but silver uh, deflect reflects most of it. Okay, so most of you have silver since you were young at home and you don't even realize it. Okay, the moment you wake up in the morning, you go to the bathroom. Most houses have got one in the bathroom. When you want to brush your teeth, what do you look at? Look at the mirror. Your mirror is made of silver. There's no other metal that can be made. Yeah? Every mirror in the world is made of silver. You don't realize that you're looking into silver. Okay. You know the CD or DVD, the reflective layer, that's silver. And sadly it gets thrown away, it doesn't get recycled. Right? Your mirror also, once it is broken, you don't recycle the silver in there, just throw it away. Interesting, yeah? Okay. And some people I know cannot live without mirror. Right? So they cannot live without silver. Yeah, uh, for over the past 100 years, we had the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Hollywood is not possible without silver. Okay? Hollywood was built on silver because the film, yeah, the acetate, the film that you see, is, it's got silver compound. Uh, it's light sensitive, so it captures images. The silver will capture images. When you process it, it becomes images. And then when you project it onto the screen, what the screen is made of what? That's why it's called what? Silver screen. Silver screen. It's not white screen, you know. If you look at it carefully, if you go there, you see tiny dust of silver. I don't know about this one, but the one in cinema, if you go to those uh, uh, TGV, whatever, you look at it carefully, it's, you see silver dust there. Because a white, uh, white screen can only reflect so much. But to get a high definition and good quality uh, image, it has to have some silver on the screen. So that's another application. Yeah. So it found its way uh, over the world, past 100 years. Photography, mirror, electrical connection, chemical <coughs> catalysis, chemical <coughs> catalyst, uh, solar panel, water purification. How many of you here got water filter at home? Maybe three stages or six stages water pur purification. The final stage of your water purifier has got some carbon and activate, uh, activated carbon and silver. Okay. That silver kills bacteria. Interestingly, only two metals that can kill bacteria very well. Copper and silver. Copper, unfortunately, will poison you. Only silver will not poison you. So if some of that silver gets into your body, it's actually beneficial for you. If it stays in your body, you kill off the other bacteria. Okay, it doesn't harm you at all. Okay, amazing. Your mobile phones, 
the screen, your touch screen, yeah, you, that you swipe, it has to have some silver because it's conductive. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the biggest demand for silver industrial is for solar. Okay. Would you agree that demand for solar is on the rise? Yeah. Okay. Silver is an essential component in the most common type of photovoltaics uh, or PV cells okay, in the form of conductive base. The top layer is uh, a germanium uh, alloy to, to convert sunlight into electrons. And once electrons go to the bottom layer, you need that silver base to capture and transport that, that uh, electron to produce electricity. Okay? Uh, uh, I hope it's not too technical. Do you get it? Okay. That's why silver is important to carry the, those electrons out of the, uh, the top layer. All right? so, and it goes into the batteries or, or uh, into um, in an inverter. Okay. So for every one megawatt of electricity produced using solar, it needs about 3,700 ounces of silver. Okay. I don't know whether we have 3,700 ounces of silver today in the showroom. Do we? Can you imagine that much of silver is needed to produce one megawatt of electricity? Okay. So, the solar energy sector consumed approximately 2 million ounces in 2001 alone. So, that was, that was not so much. And then, about 10 years later, it was consuming 50 million ounces. 2011, it was 17 million ounces. Today, it's over 100 million ounces for solar. Do you agree that solar is here to stay? Okay. Because human being, we don't want to burn fossil fuel for energy anymore. We are tired of that. It's very destructive to Mother Earth. So, uh, countries and people over the world, they are looking at alternative energy. Yeah? The most viable right now is wind and uh, or hydroelectricity or solar. Okay. So, demand is expected to go up. It's nowhere but go up. And then the next application, important application is RFID. Okay, RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification Tax. You already have this in your toll tag. If you have pet, dog, if you know, uh, some country is mandatory for you to inject that RFID tracking. And in your car, you also have it as an anti theft device. Okay? And RFID tags are far superior than barcodes because it doesn't need human intervention. Can you imagine one day you'll be able to go to hypermarket, you load all the stuff that you want, your grocery in the trolley, and instead of queuing up at the cashier counter, because they had to scan by barcode, but in the future you don't have to do that anymore. You just walk through a scanner, it will just kiching, 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 give you the total, and probably on that day itself, you will take your wallet, your wallet has got, an, uh, or your card, your credit card, your debit card will have the RFID. Some it's already have you know, some some of the uh, issuing bank already have. You just wave it. That's it. You're out of the grocery lane very fast. In and out of the grocery store very very fast. Wouldn't that be uh, convenient? I, I don't like queuing up, especially month end, uh, gaji time. Uh, you have to fight with other people uh, queuing up very long to pay for your grocery. Okay, this is already in motion right now. They are producing this. Because in the past, it was, it was uh, not so economical. Yeah? Now they found a way to make RFID cheaper by... Instead of uh, having a power source, it resonates. It can resonate by printing a thin layer of silver in the form of like, like a silver ink. Yeah? So the silver needed for that is very thin. So uh, versus the price of the product, it's... It's, it makes sense for them to, to put in RFID tag, to print an RFID tag on the uh, goods. Yeah. So it is set to replace barcode immediately. As we speak, it is happening right now. Okay, uh, moving on quickly. The next one is brazing alloys and solder. Okay, uh, pipe joints, right, uh, for heating or even food production. They use a lot of silver as the brazing, brazing material. Uh, one thing, one property about silver is that once it, it cools down, it forms a very, very uh, tight, uh, leak proof. And it's very tight, it's very durable. So it is being chosen uh, in automotive or industry. Okay. Especially if it's a, a, a food production, okay? food grade, 
if you if you look at uh, some factory producing food, uh, like milk and all that, all the piping is braced with silver because it is food grade. It is non toxic. So it is ex uh, expected to grow. Uh, this is a, I'm just going to touch a one important application, which is the Italian oxide. Uh, bear with me, I know uh, some of you are not chemical engineer like me, so you wouldn't know what the Italian oxide is, you have no clue. But this chemical plays an important role in your daily life, you don't even know it. Okay. Uh, it is a compound of wide range application. Italian oxide can only be produced with silver catalyst. Okay. I'm not going to talk about the chemical reaction here, I'm just going to skip. Mm -hmm. okay. it is, uh, uh, Italian oxide is a critical compound in the production of products like detergent. You all use detergent, detergent at home, yeah? uh, thickener and solvent. But three quarters of uh, Italian oxide consumption involve Italian glycol, a derivative. Italian glycol is used in huge number of consumer products, including antifreeze, polyester, your clothes, some of your clothes, uh, uh, synthetic fiber. Uh, they use Italian glycol. Paints, inks, plastic, most of the plastic, your cosmetics, even it finds its way in pharmaceuticals. So Italian glycol is crucial to the modern society. And Italian glycol cannot be produced, yeah, interesting enough, only silver. Silver is the only catalyst that can produce, that can turn Italian into Italian oxide and Italian oxide into Italian glycol. If, you, if there's no more silver, you don't get the modern convenience that you have right now. All these plastics are all made from Italian glycol. This laptop, okay, right? It, 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 it is linked to silver. Okay. <clears throat> now we talk about where silver come from and why we are having uh, um, uh, a challenge right now in uh, getting silver supply. Okay. Silver today, not like unlike last time, it's it's mined only as a byproduct. Okay. Silver is only mined as a byproduct in polymetallic deposits. I will explain what, what this is. Eh? Alongside other key metals like lead, zinc, gold, and copper. In the past, there's a standalone silver mine. You operate that mine solely for the silver. But now, those silver mines are dwindling. Those silver mines are becoming extinct. So most of the, uh, over 70% of the silver that you get today are mined from, uh, as a byproduct. So when, uh, when uh, this mine, <coughs> say mine gold, or lead, or, or uh, zinc, that is the uh, primary metal. Silver is only the byproduct. Okay, you you see the uh, see how important this is, you know. Okay. There are less and less silver mine going around, uh, being discovered also. Okay, and most of the silver comes from this continent, the America, from uh, Canada all the way down, down there to the tip of the American continent. Okay, so the, the biggest silver mining countries in 2013 were Mexico. In 2013, Mexico produced close to 170 million ounces in that year, followed by Peru, okay. followed by China. Okay. China is one of the largest, but they still import silver. Even though they produce a lot of silver, they import silver. They clever not? Silver don't go out from China. Gold also don't go out from China. They bring in. Gold do not go out. Okay. All right. What China, what they're doing? Australia, no surprise. Australia is, uh, is uh, a commodity-based uh, country. They produce gold, they produce a lot of minerals. They produce silver. Silver is one of the uh, highest, uh, one of the things that they export. Russia, okay. Russia, still a lot of land in Russia has not been discovered. A lot of mines have not been discovered. So Russia can also potentially produce more silver than, than recorded. Okay, just gonna go down to this. All right. So most of these countries are located in the American continent. Argentina, who knows what's the meaning of Argentina? Argentina means Argentum. Argentum means? Silver. Yeah. So it's a silver country, just like we have uh, Perak, a silver state of Malaysia that used to produce silver. Okay. So, uh, 2000, just pay attention to the last bar chart. The last bar chart is 2013. So in 2013, the production of silver worldwide was 800 million ounces. Remember this number, 800 million ounces in 2013. 2014 was also around about there. 800 million ounces. This year is set to be lower because there are less silver being discovered. 
and then it's going to be lesser the year after that, and lesser the year after that, until, until when? What does that tell you? Have you heard this thing called big oil or big silver? Okay, the good times of getting a lot of silver is over. So silver supply is dwindling. Okay, we, the more they dig the earth, they may not find that much silver left. So whatever silver that you have right now, so you better grab it lah. Huh? All right, so much to go around. Okay, all right. So I'm going to talk about the, the demand of silver. Yeah? Okay, right now, uh, silverware is naturally is decreasing. Like, who here eat with silverware? No, I also don't do that. Like. All right. Uh, if you have those, those are probably show pieces at home. You don't actually use it. Yeah. One day you might want to take out and use it. Like, huh? You never know if the the food, uh, the silver turns black, you know, like what we you mean put inside there. Okay, so silverware is decreasing from seven to four percent over the over a decade, uh, and people discover it. People now start to realize uh, silver as an investment. So you see the bars and coins, the second bar chart, from seven percent to twenty percent. So more and more people realize that hey, something is something is going on with silver. I better buy some, you know. And photography naturally is is reducing because we we have what right now to replace digital a digital camera right so those uh, company producing this they are uh, it's a sunset business okay all right jewelry jewelry did not decrease from twenty one to eighteen percent so jewelry actually remains stagnant it's about covering about twenty percent of silver production it's about that. Okay, so I will explain to you why maybe it's set to go up. Jewelry, silver jewelry is probably going to go uh, on the rise. Okay, industrial fabrication naturally is going to go up because they are they find more and more users of silver. All right, so uh, I'm just going to talk about coins and bars and the, uh, coins and bars demands. What what you see behind you? Those are coins and bars, and the demand has been exploding yeah, since 2009. Bef prior to 2008, nobody bothers. It only <coughs> The, the annual uh, production of silver to make into coins and bars are only about 15 million ounces worldwide. And then suddenly in 2009, when silver becomes a bit more volatile, when silver uh, comes into human consciousness, suddenly it exploded. And 2013 sale was 245 million ounces of investment grade silver being sold. Okay, This is the top three coins right now in the world. The top three popular coins. This is a legal tender, silver bullion. Uh, top of the list is American uh, American Eagle. Second is the Canadian Maple. And third is the Austrian Philharmonic. And you see that the sales, look at the bar chart, don't look at the numbers. Year on year is on the increase. Okay. And this year, because I'm in the silver market, this may have pro problem, have a challenges to supply. Okay, there are sometimes the American, uh, the uh, US mint, there are some months they have to actually stop production because there's not enough silver to uh, they don't get enough raw silver to produce the coins okay. and we will see uh, this trend happening it's not easy there's a silver shortage right now but demand is going up right if more of you suddenly uh, tell your friends to buy more silver we'll see a spike in canadian maple leaf sales okay, okay i'll talk about jewelry this is this is another choke factor, right? Okay, in India, okay, we'll talk about India quickly. So it has increased, and I'll tell you why. In India, uh, silver jewelry is on the increase. Okay, I'm just gonna show this chart here. Okay, last year alone, a record of seven thousand over tons, seven over thousand tons of silver being shipped into India. Okay, because India got this this problem. Uh, their population is growing. India's population is growing, and their per capita income has also been growing. People there got money. They want to buy gold, but there's an import restriction of gold in India right currently. So if they cannot get gold, what do they do? They, they go to the next best one, which is so silver sales in India has been booming for the past one year. So if you have a way. To, to sell silver in India, you'll be very very prosperous over there. Yeah. So to me, you can you can think about supplying silver to India. They can't get enough of silver in India. 
they have restriction. They have uh, restriction on importing gold, but they don't have for silver. Okay, and people there go for silver. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, exponential growth demand for solar worldwide. As you can see, 2013, and you see the 2014 and 15 chart is it's I cannot fit it in the in the in, in the PowerPoint slide. It's even higher than that. Okay, it's exponential. It's, it's mind boggling. <coughs> Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, I hope. Did I exceed the time? No one? Good time, huh? Okay, some of you are hungry. You can smell the food already. Alright, okay. I'm just gonna finish up very quickly. Alright, uh, here's a first few slides, uh, 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 a few final slides that I'm gonna show off. Okay. Why is silver an investment opportunity of the century? Okay. Historically, for the past 5,000 years, Okay, the ratio of gold to silver has always been 1 to 15, on average, 1 to 15. Okay. There's a reason for that. Incidentally, on planet Earth, for every 1 ounce of gold that you find, that you dig up, you can find 15 ounces of silver. So it's a natural ratio, 1 to 15. Some scientists argue it could be 112 or 119. I don't want to argue with the number, but I take the average 1 to 15. Alright. So for the past 5,000 years, can you imagine that? One ounce of gold can get you 15 ounces of silver. Okay, where are we today right now? Okay. Don't, don't pay attention to the... Uh, for the past uh, 50 years, the average gold to silver ratio is 1 to 15. So it's, it's really skewed. It is very distorted. And it is more distorted this year. One troy ounce of gold can get you 75 silver. Can you imagine if it goes back to its natural ratio, which I believe it is. Right now, it is being manipulated, this price right now, 1 to 75. It cannot sustain at that level. It will go back to equilibrium, and I believe it should go back to its natural uh, ratio of 1 to 15. If you were to buy silver right now, imagine if it goes back to its natural ratio. Okay, so that's why I say this this opportunity will not come again maybe for the next few hundred years. In this century, this is a very good opportunity right now because silver has always been 1 to 15. Okay? Uh, if you look at, if you, if you adventurous enough, you look at the silver maple, sorry, the Canadian gold maple leaf. Did you see the face value of the gold maple leaf just now? Anybody can tell me what's the, what's the face value? 50 Canadian dollar. Correct or not? Correct or not? 50 Canadian dollar on the one troy ounce gold. Correct? Eh? Do you notice the silver? How many dollars? Five dollar. Sorry. Fifty dollar this, this fifty dollar is gold actually. Okay. For silver, it is actually five dollar. You look at it again. Five dollar. $5 for silver, 1 troy ounce, and $50 for gold, 1 troy ounce. What's the ratio? 1 to 10. So Royal Canadian Mint believe that the actual ratio should be 1 to 10, not 1 to 50, even lower, 1 to 10. Right. This is historical. Like when they, why did they put 50 US dollars for gold? Why did they put $5? If it cost more than that, why did they still put 5 It's for historical reason because at that time, during the good old days, Many decades ago, it used to be five dollar, and you can buy a lot of things with five dollar. Okay, you can buy what can you buy with five dollar? Seventy years ago, right? You can buy a lot of things. Okay. So that at, during at that time also the ratio was one to ten. Okay, today the ratio is one to seventy five. Do don't you think it's an investment opportunity of a lifetime? I don't think this would ever come again in my lifetime or your lifetime. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show some video to summarize and then we'll go to Q and A. Please, uh, please ask questions. So I'm just going to uh, uh, show you a video that summarizes my presentation today. So bullion doesn't pay interest or dividends, yeah. Okay. If you find such investment, they say you buy this gold, it gives you uh, monthly income, or you buy this silver, it gives you dividend. What must you do? Run away lah, you know. Can can gold or silver grow in size or not? Can it give you cash flow or not? Okay, but what it does, 
it protects you. It is an insurance. It's a foolproof insurance. It protects you from being poor. It gives you that peace of mind. It gives you gives you tranquility. It makes you sleep better at night. Yeah, that paper stash that you have, this got expiry date lah. Can you sleep lah if you have a lot of this? Actually, you know, you should keep more gold and silver. Or jewelry, okay. And interesting, uh, jewelry can also be money. I remember during uh, uh, when Japan lost the war, my grandmother had a lot of gold jewelry. Uh, she had to go buy grocery, and she was using, she was cutting the the gold jewelry to buy grocery. It can also be money. Okay, can you do that with paper? Uh, cut pieces. I want ten cent. Can or not? Uh, okay, I'm just gonna uh, show you a video.